All right, we're live on YouTube. Post the link to Facebook. And I'm going to start admitting people. I see they are all oh. I see them. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Where did you get the, the graphic in your um, Zoom background? Um, I don't remember. It's just online someplace. Um, but I can send it to you. I like it. <laughs> It's just cute. Me via email. Send it. I can't tell if I can see. Oh, I Hi, Mark. <laughs> and welcome everyone who's just tuning in now. I'm going to give a couple minutes and then get started here. Thanks for being here. Probably going to start at about 7.05, just to kind of give a little bit of a buffer time for some people who are tuning in. Is the chat option open for everyone, Allie? Yes. Can people is. send where they're from? I'm curious to see what areas of the world we're covering right now. Shout out Sherry Tucker. <laughs> Canada. Oh, we got two Canada. <laughs> From the anarchist territories. <laughs> Baltimore. Where's that? Dave Bellew. I'm from Rockville. What's up? <laughs> Hello. Hi. Do you teach at Towson? I feel like I, I feel do. like we're friends on Facebook. That could be. We, we must be. Yeah, I, I grew up in Rockville, so. Great. Go Maryland. Now? No, I'm actually in Ann Arbor right now. Um, I go to U of M. Great. Well, it's nice to meet you. You too. Let's reconnect on Facebook. Yeah, definitely. Just for everyone who's just turning tuning in, welcome. Thank you for being here. We're just going to wait a few more minutes. 
let some people trickle in and then we'll get started. Hi, Sherry. It's good to see you. This is Jacob. Hi, Jacob. Probably get started in about two minutes here. Thank you all for your patience. Hi, Terry. This is Carlos. I, I play at Christine Jensen, my kill jazz band, I'm the bass player. All right. Um, yeah, I can't really see everybody, um, but nice to, <laughs> nice to hear you. Yes, I just want to say hello. Hello. And I will be here probably. I will need to turn off my camera, but I will be here listening and participating with my ears. All right. <laughs> okay, yeah, now I see you. I changed the view. <laughs> awesome. Get started in one more minute, everyone. Thank you all for your patience. Welcome to those who are just coming in. All right, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Ali Taylor and on behalf of Music Deconstructed, I wanna welcome you to our first keynote session and third event of See Better, Hear Better, Know Better, a two day online symposium on deconstructing race and gender biases in music. We are so excited to be putting on this series of events and we want to thank University Musical Society, the Alliance for the Transformation of Musical Academe, and the Excel Department at the University of Michigan and the Jazz and Contemporary Improvisation Department at the University of Michigan for making this possible. Our team is comprised of Sammy Sussman, Eliza Salem, Aiden Taylor, Alon Sullivan, Meg Brennan, Bob Hurst, Ed Sarath, Mark Hannaford, and Josie Alla, and we all are so excited to be able to present Terry Lynn Carrington tonight. Terry Lynn is a three-time Grammy award-winning drummer, producer, educator, and activist. Her album, Money Jungle, Provocative in Blue, named her the first woman to ever win the Best Jazz Instrumental Grammy Award. She currently serves as the founder and artistic director of the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender, and Gender Justice, which recruits, teaches, mentors, and advocates for musicians seeking to study jazz with gender equity as a guiding principle. 
Tonight, she will be partially moderated by Eliza Salem, a student here at the University of Michigan and co-organizer of this event. Eliza is an up-and-coming drummer who studies with Paul Carr, Chris Allen, and Michael Gould. That's who I, I used to study with them when I was a kid. Ah. <laughs> I study with Michael Gould now. Michael Gould. Just and, to clarify. <laughs> and Carl Allen. Awesome. Well, let's get started here. How are you guys tonight? Thank Great. you, Ali. Doing well. <laughs> um, thank you for having me be a part of this. And thank you, Terry Lynn, for agreeing to be a part of this. Um, super excited to get to talk to you with these about these things. Um, I'm sure everyone on the call is very excited to listen. We've got a lot of people from what I can see. So um, let's just jump right into it. Um, so as Ali just said, you are spearheading this program at Berkeley that focuses on um, exploring jazz or Black American music through the lens of gender equity. Um, and what I would like to know is, is there trackable progress in our work for equality and dismantling um, patriarchy and white supremacy? And I know that your, uh, your work at Berkeley is a perfect example, example of this kind of progress. What are some other kinds of um, trackable progress that you think we could all work on as musicians um, to better ourselves in our respective institutions and even just on the bandstand? Well, that's a great question, a way to get right into it. Uh, you know, <laughs> normally people start with, you know, background information. I like the fact that you just jumped. We all know who you are. That's Everybody's <laughs> here because they know who you are. <laughs> I never, you know, I never take that for granted. Um, and then sometimes people know things, you know, parts, partially about me, but uh, not, uh, you know, not the things that may even be important to me. Like people tend to also uh, talk about Grammys and, and things like that, which, and of course the Institute. Um, one thing I will uh, correct is we did change our mission statement to add uh, racial justice as well, because uh, the more I figured out, you know, like, connections, you know, the intersections between all these justice struggles, the more that I realized that uh, we needed to add that to our um, mission statement. Uh, as far as uh, trackable progress, um, yeah, I mean, we, we haven't done any studies, so statistics um, and things like that I mean, we haven't really, we've only really been in classes for three semesters. We're just starting our fourth semester now. So, um, but what I have found interesting as far as um, statistics are concerned um, is that once I, I did a, a bit of a, I guess, down and dirty um, statistical inquiry myself by uh, looking at magazine covers and came to the conclusion that uh, only 5% of women are, you know, as successful as, as instrumentalists in the same way that um, our male counterparts are. So people that may grace the cover of a magazine or be considered um, titans or words like that, you know, in jazz, about 5%, it seems. And I noticed that number keeps popping up um, I noticed it came up in something I read, uh, I think it was, I can't remember, the, I, I, I didn't write it down, but it's, um, it came from London, I believe, and they said, uh, an article I read there said something about 5% to of women instrumentalists, and I think people, you know, that, that number, it keeps hovering around that number, which I find, you know, pretty fascinating, um, that it's so small, um, it, so I, I always joke, uh, about, you know, statistically speaking, um, roughly 10% of the people that have orbited space have been women, so that you, you know, have a better shot at going to the moon than uh, being jazz famous or being considered a jazz genius or um, a jazz star and all those things as a woman. So I always uh, found that as an interesting analogy 
Uh, I know there was an Annenberg report, um, but you know, on engineers and producers, which is even worse, at least when they did that report, of, I think 2%. So um, as far as you said trackable progress, as far as um, people you know, like on stage, you said, I think at the end of your question, you said, what can people do um, as players or musicians or you know, in the field on stage? I think um, one of the main things would be uh, to try to you know, be as inclusive as possible. Um, you have to do work and what, you know, you sometimes have to sometimes work to find uh, you know, other people to be inclusive. And that's with anything. And um, yeah, I get the feeling sometimes that uh, a lot of jazz artists that I see, I feel like they're not you know, really doing that work. The ones that are, of course, you notice right away. And I've been really fortunate to play with people that, that have, um, like Wayne Shorter, who I don't know, you know, I don't feel like he was consciously saying, you know, I want to, you know, this percentage or I want, you know, to work with women. But over the years, he, he's hired a lot of women. And, you know, his reasoning was uh, because he read a lot of science fiction books and felt like in those books, uh, women and children were in the forefront, you know, were the future of, you know, making things happen. It seemed like um, he was imagining a different future based on uh, what he likes, you know, his taste in books and movies. And it's always about moving forward. Um, and I, I think, you know, his approach is something that we could all learn something from. Um, because in general, I feel like we have to keep pointing to the future because um, we as musicians and artists, I think we're, we, our tendency is to talk about, you know, in, in our art, to talk about what's happening in the present. And sometimes we look to the past um, and, and talk about that. Sometimes we're critical of the past. Sometimes we're just reporting the present in the past. Uh, and, and, and sometimes, um, you know, we're just reporting what's happening, but sometimes, you know, we're critical of what's happening now. But I don't think there's enough, um, enough, uh, I guess, narrative about imagining different possibilities for the future, pointing us in, um, you know, in a direction that's not the obvious one, you know, when it's not the status quo or just, you know, kind of along the trajectory we've been going along. Um, of course, some people have done that, um, especially like, you know, uh, I guess it would be called Afrofuturism now, um, people like Sun Ra and, well, you know, some people have done that. But um, I don't think there's enough of that going on because it's so, you know, many ways to, to look at a different future. And, um, I think that's, you know, one thing that I'll be working on myself as I write new music. Um, I really want to, to point to a, 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 I want it to be transformative as far as what it's actually um, suggesting, you know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and I know that a lot of you know our work as musicians we tend to draw upon our experiences um you know growing up in this field as musicians i'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about your experience growing up as a black woman studying jazz playing the drums um in a time that was obviously very different than the time that i'm growing up in that any other young woman in this call would be growing up in yeah um well, I, mean, I always look at my situation as um, being really fortunate because my, my father really helped almost like usher me onto the jazz stage. And, um, you know, without him doing that, I, I don't think I would, you know, be where I am today. And that was because he had relationships with, with people because he was a musician. And so for me, growing up around jazz musicians and 
people coming to our house, Nat Adderley, Clark Terry, and Papa Joe Jones, and uh, lots of different people coming to our house, that was all really normal for me. So I was comfortable around musicians, which were, of course, mostly male, um, you know, mostly older, at least a generation, sometimes two older than me. And that became quite comfortable. And um, because, you know, they respected my dad, too, um, I was never really uh, subjected to very much inappropriate behavior. Um, and I was encouraged. Um, and I think a part of that was because I had something, you know, quality or something to my playing that made them, I don't know, feel a responsibility to encourage me, you know. Um, I remember once Illinois Jacquette calling the house like in the middle of the night and he had some drinks and he said to my dad, she's just not supposed to be able to play like that, which I found, you know, really interesting because <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what he was implying. Um, you know, if he was implying age or gender, <laughs> you know, but, you know, he was also very encouraging. You know, he had me, uh, you know, play with him quite a bit. I played on a TV show with him. And so I just feel like I, I got more encouragement than most um, young women do. And um, so it, it, because of that, it also made me a little bit blind to what other women went through or were going through. And also at that time, we're talking about the 70s, um, I didn't really see any other women <laughs> playing. You know, there weren't very many. Um, the only woman I think I ever saw play the drums back then and that was just because we didn't have YouTube and all that, right? So um, that was just, I went to a festival. I think it was in Michigan. That might've been the Michigan Women's Jazz Festival. I don't remember the name of it, but, um, and I think that's when I saw Dottie Dodgen play. Um, and yeah, that was the first time I saw a woman play. Uh, and then later when I went to college and I got to Berkeley, uh, Cindy Blackman was also at Berkeley at that time. So that was probably the second other woman that I ever saw. Um, so yeah, it's interesting because now at least there's more community. Um, not, you know, for women, not just, because um, I think what happened was women tended to have to find their own community because um, they weren't you know, necessarily supported. So I think that was really bad for um, developing you know, your, your, yourself as a musician, forced to be a leader too early. Um, I think that uh, women weren't getting nurtured in, um, you know, it's an apprentice art form and, and I think women weren't getting mentored in general, some were, but in general, uh, not in the same way. I think that's, we'll all agree on that. Um, so, in order to continue to play, you had to either start your own group and or, you know, band together. And uh, I think, you know, I, I know for a fact that the best thing is to get experience playing with people that are better than you and uh, to be mentored that way. And if you don't really have that coming, you know, at you, I think that's probably, you know, a bit um, of what's stifled sometimes, the, you know, the development of uh, what I think what we're trying to do now is when we talk about gender equity and gender justice, um, I think, you know, the, the healthiest, uh, I don't want to say healthy, but that's not the right word, but uh, the stages I enjoy watching are stages that, um, have you know men and women playing and um, people of, of different uh, backgrounds and different experiences you know coming coming together um, you know creating something and I think that's probably uh, why one reason at least why uh, my album current album Waiting Game um, is being uh, well uh, accepted being accepted. Uh, getting some attention um, because, uh, well, one, you know, I always 
think about a very funny thing. I know this may sound, <laughs> um, I don't know how it will sound silly, but one, I always wanted to be in a band and never really, never really happened. Even playing with other people, I never felt that band feeling uh, to we can really grow and develop with the same group of people. Um, there's something very special about that. And I always play with people for it, like a tour. So even though I play with Wayne Shorter off and on for 10 years, it was always different people in the group. And the same thing with, with Herbie Hancock. So if I played in one group for a year, and that's just like really a few tours or whatever in that year, it's not the same that you develop like with a real working band. Um, I always felt a little robbed, so to say, of that experience. Um, kind of just being a work for hire going with different people all the time, never really fully getting that thing that happens when you play with the same people over and over, develop some music. Um, so I, that always made me want to have a band or be in a band. And I've tried a couple of times in the past, but it just it didn't really work out. Um, so this time um, I also took a page out of, you know, some great jazz musicians book books, some of their books, and um, got with people that are younger than me, um, the people that I admired, you know, uh, people whose writing I admired and people whose playing I admired, um, people have a different um, set of experiences, you know, coming up, so look at music a little bit differently. Um, and I really like, you know, this kind of multi-generational um, band. Um, and multiracial band. Um, and I think in some ways, you know, kind of not predicted, but superseded, I don't know the right word, uh, this moment that we're, we're seeing right now you know, in America. Because um, at first, you know, I did, I had the thought, you know, I start this band with two white guys and most of the music we're talking about is racially, you know, racial justice music. Um, and as well as other other struggles, but um, you know, I wondered, you know, I was wondering at the time, you know, sometimes you wonder what people will think or if they'll be pushed back in in, in any way. Um, and in fact, you know, it, it feels like it was exactly the right thing at the right moment. And um, I'm learning a lot, really, from you know these great musicians. And I think. Uh, you know, I did what I wanted, you know, to happen to me, you know, before in earlier years, I, I got with people that I felt like could kind of push me a bit in a, in a, in a direction um, that I wasn't really in, so to say, you know, I mean, because it's funny because a lot of people when I do interviews for this record, people, you know, say that, you yeah, know, we never really heard you, you know, go quite in this direction. And I've always, you know, mix or let other genres influence um you know the music that i write but you know this definitely you know pushed the boundary a little more even for me so um anyway i don't know if that even answered your question i'm not sure what your question was now but that's, <laughs> oh. that's fine we're talking about some great know. stuff now um i like that you kind of touched upon why you hired the people or why you were playing with those certain people in your band um something that i would like to discuss is these like you know these all we have all women bands now like the diva jazz orchestra and we have like wijo women in jazz organization um and i'm curious what your thoughts are on representation like that um and going along with that hiring someone because they're a woman or not hiring someone because you don't want, or hiring someone for reasons that are not purely musical or don't have everything to do with the music that you're making in the moment? Well, I mean, what's interesting about that is it goes both ways. And uh, people tend to do that, but I, I think if you really want to make change, you have to, again, step outside of your comfort zones and, and push boundaries. 
And if people didn't think like that, we would just be, you know, re regenerating the same types of bands over and over again. Um, so I, I don't really believe in like, you know, segregating men and women, you know, or, or any, any groups of people um, to play music. I just, uh, it's never been something that, that's why I think I always shied away from one reason, um, all women bands and people would ask me to do it quite frequently. And it wasn't until I did the Mosaic Project that I felt comfortable doing it. But I, I did it when I was ready, when I came to a point where, and it was really because I had already been playing with Jerry Allen and um, Tinica Postma. And then I booked a gig uh, in Israel. And uh, it was the first time I played with Esperanza Spalding. And I realized that I just happened to call these women. And this was this quartet. So that became, you know, something happened at that moment. I said, oh, I really want to celebrate, celebrate this. And um, the Mosaic Project happened. Um, but at the time, uh, I didn't feel like, I guess what I'm saying is I felt like a lot of uh, women in the past, like if you look at the, the big bands in the 40s, um, you know, they, they did that, why? Because of, you know, the need to at the time, um, right? So, so many men were, you know, off, you know, fighting a war and, they, you know, they needed these big bands at the time, you know, entertainment. And, but what's great is there were so many women that were, that were able to play. And it, it just makes me think about um, how when women do something, you know, like back in the day, it was, and it was for entertainment. So, you know, you, when you had a big band of women, sometimes, you know, the novelty of that took over. Um, I mean, if you look back at, um, even like Angela Davis points out in her uh, book, uh, Blues Legacies and Black Feminism, how um, when Bessie Smith started singing the blues, you know, became entertainment, you know, but what I took away from that is like when, when the men, you know, were playing the blues and traveling and this was work and it represented freedom and work. And when women did it, you know, it was, it's, it's entertainment or, um, you know, just, you know, being looked at, um, you know, objectifying women and all of those things that, that happen uh, and it's not taken in the same, you know, the same way as a, a man working seriously. And I think I've, I've felt that along the way um, because I work harder than anybody I know. <laughs> Definitely, you know, any man I know, I work harder. I'm, I'll, I have no issues saying that. <laughs> um, and, you know, I feel that there's been a history of, um, like I was, <laughs> I was in a group, I won't mention names, but it was two women and a guy. And when we went to talk about a gig coming up in the fee and some of the business, he said, oh, no, I don't talk about money. You know, talk to the office. I don't talk about money. And I just, it killed me because I was like, wow, what a luxury, you know, like I, I can't afford to do that. You know what I mean? It's like, the choice is I'm just a creative. I, I'm just, you know, a genius that, that people will give me the space and the freedom to create and I don't have to deal with details. I don't have to worry about anything. Matter of fact, you know, just show me where to go and just leave me, you know, to myself to create. And, <laughs> and a lot of these people are supported by women, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, wives or managers or patrons and, um, I always think, I often think about um, if women had that same kind of invisible labor, uh, what, what would the music have been like, you know, or what would it be like, you know, what, or, you know, where would it go? Um, because, you know, women obviously still tend to have a lot more and a lot of other responsibilities on top of that, um, just the burden of 
all the other things that I think men don't naturally have to deal with in the music. Like when um, we had a trio with um, Jerry Allen and Esperanza, the two of them talked about how this was the first time they felt like they, they could take their guard down. I, I found that really fascinating because I didn't necessarily feel that way. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, Esperanza, I mean, the way they were explaining it to me was that there's all these, you know, things that you may be thinking about, like, do, do, do they think I can play? Or, you know, do I really sound like I'm hitting like, you know, like the next guy? Or, you know, am I too sensitive? Oh, are they looking at my legs? Oh, you know, are they letting me play because they think I'm I'm attractive and add, you know, some look to the band? Or, <laughs> You know, like all these things that go through your mind that have nothing to do with the music and things that men don't have to deal with. Um, I always chose kind of not to deal with those things and always was confident enough to feel like I didn't have to worry about those things, you know. They might have been there, but I just, I guess, ignored it um, or maybe wasn't sensitive enough um, to even know that it was happening um but it was interesting to hear them talk about it and i was and but i felt a difference too you know playing with them i mean i think um it was very freeing i mean i, I definitely didn't feel maybe as much of being worried about what people think and i think that that's that's that was one important part of me playing with that trio i could just be me and you know my thing is trying not to be overbearing or to, you know, as a drummer in a trio, I can kind of just, you know, plow my way through, or, you know, be like a bulldozer. So I'm always, you know, but I've always been that way, you know, too careful that I'm not overdoing something, overplaying, over, you know, playing, being too loud and all these things. And, um, you know, I wondered, you know, just, you know, being a woman, if that had anything to do with it because I felt like my male colleagues weren't thinking so much like that and I felt like people weren't being as critical like I remember once we played as a trio at the Vanguard and uh, somebody reviewed us I think it was the New York Times but or the Village Voice one of them but um, and they said I was too loud and I, I, you know, I played too loud too much and um, it was interesting because it messed with me that whole week and then the, the last night, you know, you play six nights at the Vanguard. And that came out, for, you know, after the first night. And then last night, Jack DeJanette came down and he was sitting in the back. And I think all week I was trying not to play too loud or not to play too strong or too much. And afterwards I said to Jack, was I playing too loud? Could you hear the bass and the piano? <laughs> and he was like, actually, I thought you could have played stronger. <laughs> So, you know, really taught me, oh, my God, I can't really pay attention to any of this stuff. Um, but my other uh, point was another, a couple of friends actually told me that, um, you know, I didn't even think about it that way, but they said, well, they wouldn't have said that if it was any of the guys playing. You know, they would never even wrote it. And it, it kind of took a, a guy to say that to me, for me to even see that as a possibility. Um, so I think it speaks to you know, my not really always being aware of things that were might have been happening with me. But it also speaks to personalities. Um, and that's you know, something that another reason why um, I'm so passionate about this, because I have a certain type of personality that um, everybody shouldn't have to have. You know, I mean, my, uh, people are born differently, right? Um, I think some things are just innate. Some things, of course, you socialize to be a certain way, but some things are innate. And I remember when I met Buddy Rich when I was um, 10, and I was a guest with Clark Terry, and uh, I wanted to meet him, and he was not too far away, and I asked, somebody to introduce me. I remember who was standing there too. Person that was an A and R person for Zildjian and um, Louis Belson, because he was playing with um, Clark Terry and I was a guest. And 
he was they, they said well maybe you should wait to meet buddy rich because he's in a bad mood and you know his flight was delayed and he just got here from the airplane he has to go on and somehow i just walked over and i wanted to meet him and they said well this is young terry she plays the drums she's a guest with clark terry and he said oh yeah well you better not be any good and my natural reaction was to say well who's going to stop me and he said hey kid you want to come want to come play with my band <laughs> You know, and then he was like, you know, really supportive of me ever since then. Every time he came through Boston, he would have me sit in. He introduced me on television shows. And, um, you know, when I look back at that, a lot of that was because immediately I showed this gumption in, at, at 10 years old, you know, kind of to challenge him. And um, that's just who I am. So um, I've met, you know, other people, male and female. <laughs> That would never have done that. So I feel that you shouldn't have to be, as a woman, you know, have this certain kind of personality um, to to make it, you know, in, in jazz. It should be very good. Uh, um, because none of those things have anything to do with um, your ability to, to be creative. You know, so then it gets down to like this sound that we've been hearing that, that's made jazz what it is, the sound that most of us love but my question is um the potential you know of the music uh to to have other qualities that we just don't even know fully what they are yet because um, the potential hasn't been realized and i don't think will fully be realized until this kind of um equity is 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 practiced or is evident. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you touch upon these dynamics and like kind of what I always, I mean, me growing up as a musician, what I saw as kind of like the old school vibe, which was like, you got to be able to hang with the boys. Like you got to, if you're going to go play at a session or you're going to play in someone's, on someone's gig, like you have to be able to hang. Um, and I, you know, that, I'm sure that ideology has produced incredible musicians, male and female, or wherever you identify on the gender spectrum. Um, but I'm also curious about your thoughts on other old school practices that may not be so politically correct nowadays. Like I, I've played some gigs with some sketchy ass dudes. That's, <laughs> I'll say that much. And like, you know, men making comments about your personality or your, the way that you, you're not playing loud enough, you're not playing quiet enough. Um, and, yeah. you know, this, what I kind of think of as toxic masculinity um, can be very prevalent in a lot of musical spaces nowadays, especially in institutions where, you know, there's a lot of of white males who are studying jazz because they have the resources to do so. Um, and the music has been put in this box through the institution that gives them the ability to, you know, complete their education in such a way that they can learn jazz and then go out in the world and play it. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you have any advice for for women who might find themselves in these spaces um, and feel unsafe, you know, maybe you're, you are the only woman on the gig um, and there's some old guy who is, you've heard some, some weird things about him, but he's played with so-and-so, so it's okay. He's really killing, you have to play the gig or you're a black woman and you show up to the gig and there's other women there, but they're all white. You know, like what is a way to approach these situations without inflicting trauma upon ourselves or re-traumatizing ourselves. Ooh, he said a lot. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was about three <laughs> we can, questions. <laughs> we can unpack that if we need to. <laughs> um, well, the first thing I think, you know, you were talking about is um, you said toxic masculinity. Um, and what I find interesting, I think, you know, that's obvious when it's there in, you know, many fields, right? Not just in, in, in ours. But 
what I find interesting uh, is, is when women find themselves having to um, perform masculinity and, and they naturally do because that's what the culture demands. And um, like I've talked to some students who actually probably felt more you know, safe or what, that's the right word at Berkeley and then left and you know went into some hardcore bands <laughs> you know and um, found that they had to do that to either put up the shield or to fit in and then they started turning into the person that they were sort of pretending to be and then it became and I've heard this from like several people which I find fascinating because I've, I've never really done that. At least I didn't recognize that I was doing it. Um, and then they decide, well, man, I shouldn't have to, you know, I shouldn't have to do that. You know, I should be able to bring my authentic self because I'm playing the music. Um, but that um, performance, you know, of, of masculinity either stopped them from getting hit on or made them acceptable, you know, in the, in the, culture in the club um, and another friend of mine uh, will talk about it in a sense of she, she looks at it like a barbershop um, like if you go to a, a black barbershop especially uh, the conversations that happen in the barbershop and if you can hang with the conversations and you know it's like a balancing act of not being too feminine or not being too masculine and this you know being able to hang and be comfortable and make everybody else comfortable in the barbershop, <laughs> you know, that's kind of like the, the, the analogy that she gave. But, uh, you know, first thing I think of is, you know, men, they don't have to go to the beauty shop, <laughs> you know, and be comfortable. You know, these gendered spaces are so interesting. Um, but, you know, some people choose or don't choose are just naturally, um, I think that was my case, um, I just more naturally um, I didn't even consider it uh, uh, performative masculinity or anything like that because it was just natural. You know, I was just as, uh, what's the word, not aggressive, but just as um, I fit in, you know, with the guys naturally. I, I still hang up with a lot of guys and, and like that space. Um, but, you know, as the older I got, you know, I love, you know, hanging out with women and that's two different spaces, but uh, in a typical sense. And, but um, yeah, I think, you know, I always think about something Bernice Johnson Regan said, which is, um, I am what I am at this particular moment and that will have to be sufficient. And when I think about that, you know, I feel like I have the freedom to, you know, to be who I want to be. And, um, bring who I want and need at the moment, you know, to the table. And um, I kind of choose choose that freedom. So I fully, you know, understand that um, it's, it's what I really feel is how unfair it is that women uh, have had to um, kind of change who they are to fit into this environment. Um, and as far as, especially like protective of being hit on, I've seen it, you know, I see, you know, people that you all know, I've seen that they've had to do it. And historically speaking, um, yeah, I mean, like Mary Lou Williams, I think she did it. Uh, everything I've you know, read and seen says, you know, that, that she did that too. And, you know, tend, tend, you know, when we do that, we tend to shy away from women that, especially women that don't do it. And that's one of the things I really admired, actually, about Jerry Allen, is I felt like she was one of the few people that really held on, you know, claimed her freedom in, in holding on to her authentic self. She really was, you know, she brought her authentic self to the table. I don't, I don't feel like she really shifted to, to fit in, you know, and if it meant something like that she you know might not get this gig or somebody says this about her because she was extremely sensitive too 
Um, but if it meant uh, sacrifice, you know, I think she was okay with that. But she wasn't, um, you know, she wasn't changing who she was. Um, which is, you know, lesson. You know, once you, you know, it's funny when people pass and you start thinking so much about all the things that you saw that you didn't realize you were seeing. Um, she's, for me, has a lot of examples of um, things I've learned and, and noticed that I didn't really even realize at the time. Um, but anyway, uh, as far as advice um, in these spaces, I mean, you said a lot, you talk about um, jazz education, which is a whole conversation in itself and systemic oppression and what has happened <laughs> with jazz. I mean, it's, I mean, it almost makes me feel bad being a teacher, you know, only because the parts, parts of me are like, you know, this, you know, this music is not really just, you know, music you learn in school, but it's turned into that um, to the point of, you know, an interesting um, thing that happened to me last week or two weeks ago is I was talking to a hip hop executive and um, basically he was forming a, a group of you know, black music, some kind of black music group. And I had asked to um, you know, be a part of it. I didn't see any jazz represented. And he was a young guy, you know, hip hop executive. And uh, he said, oh, I always thought of jazz as being more white. And it was just a light bulb went off, <laughs> you know, for me because, um, you know, I think with, with jazz education, that's kind of exactly uh, why somebody in their, you know, late 20s, early 30s, you know, might, might think that if they haven't really studied the music. Um, and it, it made me feel like, oh, okay, jazz, the trajectory of jazz, um, has become, you know, less and less, uh, well, well, you know, like you said, just because of accessibility, you know, it's become less and less um, uh, accessible to, to people of color, you know, from the communities that, you know, invented the music in the first place. So um, there's a lot more work that has to be done there. And I know that I talked to the people in admissions um, at Berkeley all the time about that. And it, t it just takes the work, you know, it takes more effort and you just have to do it. And I don't, you know, quite understand when I'm, when I'm trying to populate my five week summer program, um, if I don't do any extra work myself, I get to bring 16 people in and I could easily bring 16 white guys in and I have to do the work to try to find diversity. Um, and it's the school, I don't know, they might be doing it in their way, but it's just, it has to be, uh, you know, con consistently, you know, challenged and, um, you know, find some other innovative ways, you know, and, and keep pointing it out to people because, um, I don't see why I, you know, if I can go online and search for people and, you know, word of mouth and call up a few friends and few, few teachers at other schools and, you know, ask for people to send some students my way and, and inevitably, you know, find um, some diversity that way. You know, I think the schools have to do that. And yeah, so that's a whole, a whole other conversation. But um, also what you said about, um, safe spaces or you said uh if you're a woman you go to a gig and it's all guys and they're shady or if you're a black woman and you go to a gig and it's all white women that how that might feel um and what what do you do um i don't have an answer for that really other than um you know you you notice it you, you recognize it you, you don't allow yourself to I think, you know, to, to be disrespected, of course, you stand your ground, you take ownership in the music, because if this is your music and you know that you belong there, being in these situations, um, it, as though they, though they may be challenging, um, 
I think you have to have such a strong sense of self and, and belonging because you're already choosing something that's hard. You know, it's hard on all levels. It's hard to play. It's, it's, it's like it takes so much sacrifice and time, you know, to learn how to play it good. Um, and nobody's going to do that if they don't really love something. So then it goes, you know, it goes back to like, how much do you love it? Like, what, how, how, you know, what sacrifices will you make? I mean, I think, you know, there's people to talk to. Like, I mean, you know, most of us have therapists that we talk to um, and, you know, don't realize, like you talked about trauma, you know, but don't, don't realize um, how much trauma, you know, we've experienced because we are so used to plowing through. So I do, I do think it's important to, um, to, to, to take care of yourself, you know, and everybody, that means something different for everybody, you know, the self-care is definitely important. And, you know, for me, it might be as simple as voicing, you know, really voicing how I feel and, you know, to somebody that hears me, you know, about things that might be very subtle, very small, and something I wouldn't necessarily talk about in a group setting, but just, you know, over the, over the course of years of things that just feel, you know, like, uh, like a little, just a little bit of weight that just adds up over time, you know? So I think self-care is definitely important, however, whatever that means, you know, to you, but also just knowing and figuring out how to really instill in yourself that you belong there, you know? Because if you, you know, make the sacrifices to try to play the music, then you must feel that, you know, you must feel some sense of ownership in it. And, um, you know, nobody should have to be, you know, I, I think about that all the time. Nobody should have to be resilient, you know, like, I feel like black women having, you know, to deal with, you know, both racism and sexism, um, have had to be some of the most resilient uh, people. And yeah, you shouldn't have to be. Like if I were to take away, you know, the various things, you know, that I've had to be resilient and just keep bouncing back from and keep, um, you know, recovering from, I don't know what would have happened, you know, like I would have had a whole lot, you know, more time and freedom and space, you know, to, to create more, you know, so, um, but that's, you know, the, the world we live in and that's what we're fighting, you know, and that's why sense of purpose and um, whether you fully step into social activism or not, but, you know, there's got to be, I think, some sense of purpose or I, if I ask somebody like why they play and they say it's fun, you know, I understand that on some level, but it makes me really question some things. You know what I mean? I think, I think you have to be a warrior spirit, you know, <laughs> to 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 play this music. And I think um, I think you you have to have a deep sense of purpose. And, and I think that if you ask, you know, you have to have the same purpose and mission uh, as a doctor or a healer, you know, or, or even, you know, a teacher too, but a teacher in the sense of not just somebody that's, um, you know, doing the job, but from the essence of what a teacher really means. And I think it's to save lives, you know, it's, it's, it's to make a difference, create that kind of serious impact on either one person or a lot of people, but, um, yeah, those kinds of victories, that's when I know that I'm living and fulfilling my purpose. So as far as advice, I think when you have that deep sense of purpose and commitment, um, and um, I won't say confidence, but just that ability to know that you belong there and um, you take care of yourself, yourself in the ways that help you to see those things. Um, I think you can walk into those spaces um, and feel better about it. Great, thank you so much. Um, 
I think I'm going to turn it over to Ali now, who's going to take some questions from people. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Eliza. So for some awesome questions. We had some people submit questions in the chat. And again, for those of you who came in late or didn't see, um, if you'd like to be considered for a question, direct message me and I will put you in the queue. We might not get to everyone, but our first question is from Zach Edelman. Please unmute yourself. Hi, Zach. What's going on? Uh, thank you so much for speaking to us, uh, Ms. Carrington. It's been incredible to hear you talk so far. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, um, so what, what advice do you have toward men? Um, just it could be small or large things to basically generate more equity and just be better uh, people on the bandstand and just to be around in general to, you know, and have to be more comfortable. Um, advice. Let's see. Um, for who to be more comfortable? For women to be more comfortable. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think what you're asking about is like allyship. Uh, and in some ways, you didn't use that word, but um, it's an interesting topic uh, because I don't really like that word so much. I'm, I'm kind of glad you didn't use it, but uh, I don't really, you know, I, I'm trying to really understand it. Um, I, I know this, it could be just the word itself, but um, I feel like if, if you're being just and fair, then you don't have to make somebody else comfortable. You know what I mean? If you're coming from a place, because see that the ally thing, I don't know, it makes me sometimes feel like um, there's a hierarchy there. And um, like you're still letting someone into a space and it's not your space to let someone into. So if you can feel that for real, then I think all the answers are right there. You know what I mean? There's no advice I can give you or anybody, you know, you have to feel like this is not your space to let somebody into. So you, you don't, you don't want to even have to feel the job of make, let, making somebody else be comfortable. I understand what you mean though. It's a difficult one, um, but I think it's, you know, it's a personal journey. Uh, as long as you're not doing the opposite, you're probably in good shape. <laughs> You know, the fact that you're thinking about it, but just make sure you're coming from it from a standpoint of not like any kind of, um, you know, no hierarchy there. And just from a standpoint of, you know, we're all equal. Yeah. And then also it forces the person that may be considered, I don't know, marginalized or whatever word you want to use, it forces them to also own that space because you know it's all energy right people feel energy everybody has intuition women may have it a little more but everybody has intuition so if i walk into a space i know what i feel you know i know what i feel and i trust it you know sometimes you know you you, you second guess yourself but for the most part if we all you know come with that energy i think things work out. Awesome. Thank you. Great question. Next question, Josie Alla. Hi, I just had a question about handling like a, a quid pro quo kind of situation where, you know, I was thinking about an example where I had this wedding gig with a guy, just one other person. And he was saying like, hey, I have these gigs lined up for you in the fall. But if you want them, you're going to have to steal that bottle of alcohol from the table and bring it out back to me afterwards. So, and I didn't do it, obviously. And I lost the gigs and a considerable amount of money because he didn't see me just as a colleague. He saw me as like more of an opportunity. So I was wondering if, if you've ever experienced that or if you had any tips for women for protecting themselves in these situations. Hmm. Um. I've not really experienced that. Um, I've not experienced it. Um, it's really hard for me to give advice because I haven't experienced it. 
of course, you know, like you, you just said, you, you didn't do it. So those that's the right choice, you know, in my opinion, of course. Um, but then it's hard to feel, I guess, uh, it's hard to not feel badly that you missed this opportunity that you wanted or that the opportunity was not really based on um, the things it should be based on. It wasn't a real opportunity in the first place. You know, that's the whole thing. You feel like you're missing an opportunity that was never really an opportunity. So I think that's the first step in letting go of whatever that was and whoever they are. And, and there's always somebody else, you know. <laughs> I learned that, you know, as a kid, as a great saxophone player, um, Candy Johnson was his name, and um, from Ohio, played with a lot of organ groups. And, you know, he, he said a few things to me when I was a kid. One was, um, your only competition is yourself. And another one was, you can only play, any, anybody can only play one gig at a time. And that's like a really simple thing. <laughs> but once I really acknowledged that, I was like, oh, well, I don't have to worry about other people or this opportunity because it's, it's only one gig. <laughs> it's like, you know, there's so many musicians and people um, that no, nobody has a monopoly you know, on things, on gigs. And um, there's no real just one big break. You know what I mean? There's a lot, lots of situations that can be like, you know, that, that transformative um, experience or break or, or band uh, that can move you to the next space, you know, in your career, next, next plateau. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, you just let those go, the things that don't happen that you really wanted. I mean, one thing that it's a very simple spiritual, um, you know, grounds me anyway, is um, this, this, this thing that was written, I don't know if it's a poem, if you would call it a poem, uh, but it's something that I try to live by, um, written by Max Ehrman. It's called The Desiderata. And at the end, I'm paraphrasing, but at the end, he basically says that the universe unfolds as it should. And it always stuck with me. And that's the one thing that gets me through when something happens. And I think I'm attached to an outcome, you know, and I don't get that outcome. And then I, I really rest in my faith of knowing that the universe unfolds as it should. And it's proven right, like every time, you know. So um, this, this was written, I don't know, like 19, I don't remember the exact year, but the early 1900s. And it's so everything in it is, you know, really holds true to today, which means I guess there's somehow great literature. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's a, or a great poem. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, thank you. Next we have Jason Parker and then and then we'll get you in, Professor Hurst. Thank you so much. Um and thank you, Miss Carrington. Um I think you might have kinda answered my question already with the first question, but I think I have a little bit of a different bent on it because I'm a I'm a jazz band director. I teach middle and high school jazz bands and one of the things that is obvious is that there's always a dearth of women in the jazz bands. Um, and I'm trying to figure out what to do about that. Um, um, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about specifically about young, you know, what, what I can do as a, as a old white dude to make young girls feel comfortable in my band room and in my band. Um, it seemed, but it seemed like you were saying you don't have enough, right? Women in your band. Yes. Is that what you were saying, right? Yeah. Yes. So it's yes. two different things, right? Uh, not having enough and then also wanting them to be comfortable. Um, the problem with not having enough is by the time they get to college, I mean, you know, it's already the problem has started in middle school. Oh, do you said you're middle school? I teach middle and high school. Yeah. Oh, middle and high school. Okay. Um, yeah, well, then hopefully you're one of the good guys because. <laughs> My radical philosophy on that is to get rid of all the middle school and high school teachers. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I say that jokingly, but there's something has gone terribly wrong, you know, from middle school 
to high school, the matriculation rate keeps going down with women. And of course it's social too, but um, I think that critical place of where somebody begins is the, the most crucial with, with teachers. So um, again, I think you, you know what to do and you're probably you know, doing it. It's an uphill battle maybe, but um, I think the more work has to be done, done with the young men in, in, in your bands probably. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yes. And that's probably where you would serve the best. With, I mean, not that you don't want to worry about the, the young women, you know, you, you do, but if, if you're a decent person, then you're going to be doing the right thing, I think, t toward the young women. The thing is, like, you know, when I, you know, this is, a, this is a little off topic, but yesterday, like, I live in an area and uh, there's a lot of flags in my area where I live. And now the, the Trump 2020 signs are creeping in. And that's the first time in my life I've felt a little bit unsafe walking. You know, and I walk every day two to three miles. That's you know, one thing I've committed to doing. I don't commit to practicing, but I commit to walking. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, and so I'm like feeling a little strange, you know, in my own neighborhood. Um, and I'm always excited and happy when somebody, first of all, I, I've, I've seen very few um, people of color in my neighborhood. So I'm very excited when somebody waves to me or speaks to me and I, I make a note of where they live in case, you know, I ever get in trouble and have to, you know, knock on somebody's door. I just never thought I would be experiencing this. Um, but anyway, this morning, uh, you know, there's cars driving and, um, you know, the people in the front, you know, driving, they, I mean, they didn't acknowledge me or anything, they, nor should they. I mean, you know, they're just, but it's always going through your mind, you know, do you think I should be here? <laughs> you know, like, do you think I shouldn't be on your block? Or all these little things that are going through your mind, the same things that go through women's minds when they're playing that I was talking about earlier. This is just a different, you know, scenario, but it's the same feelings. Um, and then there was a little girl, like about five, maybe four or five in the back. And then she smiled and she started waving. And I was like, it really hit me how much of all the things that we're talking about um, are learned, right? Learned behaviors. And inevitably, when I see children, young children, I don't feel any of these things. And it made me think we've all terribly failed, you know? We've failed as, as, as parents, as teachers, most of us, you know, or we wouldn't be in this predicament. Something happened along the way. And um, so it makes me think about how I teach, you know, and how, uh, what I, I just don't want to fail, you know, because there's, there's something in there that, you know, I do, I'm saying this because if it's learned behavior, where do you, where do you learn your behavior? You learn it from your family, you learn it from your colleagues, your friends, you know, ultimately, you know, from everybody that influences you. So we as teachers um, influence these kids. And um, that's why I'm saying that it's difficult work because it's easy just to, to not um, really deal with it because the boys, I think that's naturally create this boys club. And how do you infiltrate that? You know, how do you, you know, make young, young kids see something different than what they're naturally doing. That's generally um, early, you know, signs of, you know, sexism or, you know, just to have, you know, peer pressure, all of these things, it's, it's a lot. I mean, I give it to anybody actually that's teaching middle school um, and high school, because it seems like really difficult work. So I don't know. I know I didn't answer you, but all I can say is work on the boys. I, I appreciate that. I also just appreciated the fact that you said it's not, you know, if you're doing what's right, you don't have to try to make people feel comfortable. I, I, that was, uh, thank you for that. Uh, you're welcome. Dr. Hurst, are you there? Trying to get a word in? Hey, Bob, Robert. Hey, what's up, Terry? <laughs> I'm good. 
this is yeah. this this is one of the last uh, live drummers I play with. In, in, in... <laughs> right, right, that's gig, right? Yeah, like before the bubble. Um, yeah. <laughs> one thing I just want to acknowledge with with, with uh, uh, Terry and also uh, our dear friend Jerry Allen is that uh, you know for me. I play. I play with Terry at the very beginning. I mean, I play with Jerry. Well, both both of you guys. Uh, uh, um, Jer- playing with Jerry Allen at the be- beginning of my uh, uh, career and seeing um, her in situations. I remember, you know, that 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 were like uncomfortable for me. Uh, 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 first one when when I was seventeen, you know, we and we were we were touring a. a, a Europe with Marcus Belgrave, and I saw this very, very prominent. I'm, I'm not going to say his name, but uh, uh, um, he was he was very, very prominent uh, uh, saxophonist in the, in the, in the early '80s. I'll let you I'll let you investigate him because I'm not going to put him on personal blast, but maybe you can find him. But uh, you know, I, I remember after we after he heard he heard, he heard our performance. And and uh, he said, uh, you know, he came up, you know, backstage, and he and he said, uh, "Yeah, girl," to Jerry Allen. He said, "Yeah, girl, you can, you you know, you can we we can wake up and you can make me breakfast, and then we can run over some changes, and then this and that." And he was saying all this fucking inappropriate stuff that was like like, you know, uh, 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 it it it. it, At the time, it didn't even seem inappropriate. It, it did to me, you know, and, and and at the time, I remember wanting to beat this guy's ass and, and, and like really, you know, defend her position and uh, and it was it was it was I, I I had never realized the the the, the what women go through. Well, I, I knew what black people went through in, in, in life, you know, but just 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 to see this person approach her like this was so. Uh, uh, infuriating to me, and I wanted to beat his ass. Jerry was like, "No, just, just you know, just be cool, <laughs> just be cool, Bob. You know, and 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 and, and, and uh, you know, don't do." It. And then I saw it again. We were on the road um, with another very, very prominent musician, and I remember we were we were uh, in Europe, and, you know, you know, uh, on tour, and we were on a road trip. And there was like a lot of uh, you know dick jokes being thrown around, and 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 and, and Jerry really objected to it, and she made it she made it a situation that if it was all guys, it would have been cool. Uh, but she really objected to this whole situation in this it, at, at this time, and it was it was. Even even for me, you know, even for me, you know, it was like it was like kind of like a like a drag to like, you know, in in in, 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 in this male environment was really uh, toxic for her. And I remember um, uh, uh, the, the musician that, that we were both playing with, you, you know, he he approached me and said, "Man, what's up? What's up with Jerry? Man, we can't, we can't, we can't do this. We can't do that. We can't do, you know, we can't say this. We can't say that. You know, she's like a." But Jerry was very steadfast, and she really held to her sensibilities, you know, as 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 just just a human. <laughs> you know, it wasn't even a big deal. You know, but but she 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 held her, you know, to her 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 uh, moral center. And it was at the expense of maybe even this gig that we were on. And it, it was at the expense, I've seen her do that at the expense of other gigs that she was involved with. And, and, and it was, you know, to, I don't want to say to the detriment of her career because she was so bad. It didn't even matter, you know, like, but, to, to, you know, just, just for me to see her go through these changes in a, in a in a normal environment. I mean, this is it's not on a gig. It's not based on your playing. It's not based on uh, uh, anything you're doing personally. It, it's, it's it's just based on. She just said, "I don't want to hear that shit. I don't want to hear y'all say this, you know, in front of me. I don't want to hear that." 
And why don't y'all just shut the fuck up and not, and not and not and not and not say that? You know, I mean, of course she would she she would never say that <laughs> those words, but that's the way I, I you know I feel. And 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 it was really interesting. That's when I really, as as a as a, as a, as a male musician, and especially as a, as a black male musician, a, a person that is 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 marginalized, to see other people marginalize her. You know, it, it, it further in, the, in 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 that in that corner. So I'm just saying that to all all my all my uh, all my all my all my fellow fe- female musicians. You know uh, uh, that that is going to be a, a a stepping stone. It's it's not going to be it's not going to be easy for you for y'all. You know, it's it's it's, it's, it's it is going to be a thing, and it's not going to be equal. You know, just just the way like all these you know Trumpy ass motherfuckers are, are are have to have you know I see I see their see their their signs on the lawn you know right next to me you know I see all of that shit. It's not gonna be easy for us, but we have to you know some somehow <laughs> you know get used to being uncomfortable. You know, so it was not really a question, but I, I know that 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 uh, I know that you know Terry Lynn, you've been through all of that stuff, and I've seen you. You know, punk a whole bunch of dudes, and 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 and, and be used to being uncomfortable. So that's not it's not really a, a question. I just wanted to recognize, you know, uh, Jerry Allen, and, and 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 I know we we're all really, you know, very close, and 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 just recognize that. Uh, and and Eliza, I remember there was there was like a. a you know, a, a toxic dude that you were around and, and that I've been around and, and, you know, just, just, just how, how do, how do you, how do you function? I just say, I just want to say, stay strong. Cause the motherfuckers ain't going nowhere. You know, they are going nowhere. So y'all just feel strong in how you deal with them and, 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 and all of that. So I'm sorry. That's, that's all I had to say. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, you keep it real. I gotta give it to you. <laughs> um, but I, I would say that I don't know. I think they are going someplace. I'm seeing shifts. So everybody needs to stay strong. I think actually, especially them, because um, you're right. I mean, I don't allow. But you know what I feel is disrespectful. I don't allow it either. And um, during the time, you know, this may have happened with Jerry. And even in my earlier years, um, yeah, you make these choices and then you might be stigmatized or you might have, you know, uh, effects that come from the choices you make. That's what cause and effect is. But um, I do think that we're moving into another time. And I think that, see, because when you say it's going to just, they're going to be there. That's act, to me, that's saying that transformation isn't possible. And I feel that it is. I feel it's happening. You know, I feel it's happening slowly. I mean, I'm looking at even, you know, if we look at, um, you know, I, I talked to, you know, Dr. Angela Davis and other people about this racial uh, justice moment, you know, what we're seeing now with Black Lives Matter and um, the results of work that has happened for all of these years. Um, people, she was happy just that John Lewis lived long enough to see this moment and that she's lived long enough to see this moment because it points to a different direction. It's pointing to a, a, another kind of future that we now see much more as possible than we may have, you know, even just a couple of years ago. Um, you know, the proof is in the pudding, of course, you know, we'll see, but there's a light at the end of the tunnel that wasn't really there before, you know, and um, it's really super exciting. And I look at the same way, you know, with um, this gender issue um, with jazz, especially when I see figures like um, in Time Magazine, I read 20% of all millennials uh, are not, don't consider themselves cisgendered or straight. And that's a huge number. That's one out of every five people. So when I see a statistic like that, I'm like, well, everybody else is gonna have to get on board or, or get off or get dropped off or left behind. 
You know what I mean? And I just want to live long enough to really see those things come into fruition. Because when you're looking at that number, one in every five people, that means things are definitely changing. And you're going to have to just get on board with it. And, and all of the older musicians that I know, you know, a lot of musicians want to remain um, relevant and want to grow. And sometimes they just need a push in the right direction. And see, you know, like, like Bob kind of, um, you know, hinted at, um, I don't mind going head to head or toe to toe with, with any man. And I mean, even just in conversation you know, about this subject. And so I almost, it's, for me, it just takes patience at this point, you know, to talk to somebody that's in the dark ages. Because if you look at, you know, college campuses and, you know, people that won't embrace pronouns because like you said, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, that's funny to me. <laughs> like, I mean, what are you saying about yourself? If you can't embrace somebody else's pronoun, what you're saying about yourself is that you're old, you're a fuddy dud, you're stuck in your ways, and eventually you'll get left behind. And so every toxic, you know, dude playing jazz, that's kind of how I feel about them. And I actually, in the end, feel, you know, empathy or, you know, feel for them because they're the ones that are not evolved or not conscious. And I don't know how you make great music. So then when I listen to the music, it's not even as great, you know? <laughs> you know, because if they can't evolve with what's happening in the world right now, then you just sound old too. You know what I mean? You just, it's not relevant to me. It's not relevant anymore because it's, you, you can't really be different than who you are, right? As far as your music, your artistry, your, everything that you do is connected to, you know, to each other. So it's interesting, interesting times. Um, but the big thing I do feel very strongly about is get on board or get left behind. And um, I think that's an incredible. So like when I get 70 year old, 80 year old, um, guys calling me saying, wow, thank you, because I guess I was just, you know, an old fart. I think the one guy that called me, a bass player, I'll tell you later who. <laughs> but, um, you know, I thought that was, you know, uh, uh, I thought that he was very evolved to do that. His playing maybe didn't change necessarily. You know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, he, he was reaching, you know, out because he really felt like, wow, I, I haven't, I didn't even notice that there weren't any women playing. I mean, basically is what he said. <laughs> I mean, yeah. but we all have to like slap ourselves. I mean, it's not just his fault. You know, it's all of our faults. You know, this entire culture, jazz has dropped the ball. But the beautiful thing is that it can pick the ball up and run with it. You know, we fumbled, you know, incessantly fumbled, you know, but we can, you know, pick the ball up and run with it. And uh, there's still, you know, this beautiful future that we can all take responsibility for. And that's, uh, you know, that's the way, the way I see it. Because, um, you know, he's not the only one. All the women dropped the ball too. That You know, lots of women bought into this. You know, um, there's a great quote. Let me see. I think I wrote it down here by Ella Baker. Do I have it? Um, she's talking about race, right? But she says, I don't know that there's anybody in this room. This was during a speech. I don't know that there's anybody in this room that's carried on a, a, carried a campaign of racism per se. But I doubt that there's anybody in this room who has not at some point been guilty of supporting a racist culture. And when I read that and I thought about, oh, or a sexist culture. So if I substitute the words and I say, I don't know that there's anybody in this room that's carried on a campaign of sexism per se, but I doubt that there's anybody in this room who has not at some point been guilty of supporting a sexist culture. Um, that's all those things make me point to myself. And that's what we all have to do because even those of us especially when it comes to allies, 
you know, that think that we're on the right. It's just like the whole thing about it's not enough to be, you know, non-racist, you have to be anti-racist. Mm -hmm. You know, you just substitute the words as far as I'm concerned. Um, can, can I, can I, can I uh, ask a follow-up non-question? Um, <clears throat> I, 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 what do you think of I, uh, moving forward, because we have to have our armor on as artists and our armor sometimes forms our arts and our armor sometimes forms who we are and how we project ourselves and how we play and, 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 and all of that stuff. So, so if we, you know, like, like, like not having that armor, do, do you feel, what, what do you, do you think that's, that that's better or, or do you think that's, uh, um, cause you know, for me, like I know I'm going to play with a whole bunch of, uh, 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 a certain group of white dudes. I'm going to bring some heat. I'm going to bring the heat. I'm going to bring the fire and I, I'm, I'm going to do that anyway, but, uh, I, I, hey, that's what I was going to say. You're going to do it anyway. <laughs> but, I, but, but I do think like, like there is a certain armor and a certain attitude that you have as a, as a, as a black musician, as, 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 as somebody going in, 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 in into into war and it is it, does that the absence of that will, will that change the game or or, or do you like I, you know sometimes i like that i'll be honest you know i like going in and fucking motherfuckers up you know and <laughs> you know so so uh, i'm just asking you that you know uh, uh, uh personally well, and what you think about that well i think that we're like i said earlier i think we're all warriors you know to play this music you have to be a warrior but um as far as armor, I think, you know, we're going to have armor, but what you're talking about is so much bigger than music, you know, in this field of music. It's just, you know, the society that we live in. So you have to have armor just to go to the grocery store or, you know what I mean? Actually, I have more armor. If I have to go to stores and, you know, whatever, gas station, whatever it is, Target, Whole Foods, Wherever I, you know, end up, you know, especially depending on what neighborhood you're in. I mean, the armor is there. You have to have armor to watch the news. You know what I mean? You, you have to have armor to just take a walk. I mean, it's just, it's, so then the questions become, you know, where, where do you dwell? How do you let that affect your work? You know, how do you, let it affect it positively or, or are you aware if it affect, affects it negatively or what does that even mean um what are you trying to say like what what is the end game you know what i mean so for me armor is there obviously all the time and for me it's about peeling it off so that i can just have freedom because what i resent is not having the same ability, you know, to, or the same, um, I don't know the right word, but what I resent is an issue of freedom. And I have to claim my own freedom. If somebody's not handing it to me on a platter, then I have to take it. And that's a personal thing, you know? Nobody can determine if I'm free or not. You know, they can do all kinds of things that could make me feel like I'm not. But I have to be the one to determine. So I have to look at everybody on this call, every student of mine, every colleague of mine, and I have to really authentically feel that one, you're no better than me. Two, you're you're not more free than I am either, because this is you know, you know, I choose. It's not even about the Constitution; <laughs> it's more of a spiritual journey, and I, I choose freedom. And I think that's a big part of why we're here. You know, which, which I think there's a quest for freedom and, you know, depending on how you look at that, some of it might be, you know, spiritual and some of it might be actual physical freedom for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, people that have been incarcerated, they quickly figure that out. You know, I've talked to people that have been incarcerated and it's hard to fathom if you haven't, but they figure out that freedom is not really just a physical thing. And so the only way they can 
really practice you know, or, or experience freedom is to take it into another realm. And there are all these levels and degrees, you know, levels of freedom to experience. So for me, I choose to be, you know, a free thinker, you know, I choose to try to walk, you know, and so what I have to personally, and I think this is what you're kind of talking about too, Bob, but I mean, I have to work on what I want to do with my anger. You know what I mean? And the one thing I know is I feel like, you know, I, I accept everybody, uh, you know, accept everybody at, as you know, on, the, on an equal plane until it's proven otherwise, until they don't deserve to be there. You know what I mean? I, tell, I give everybody the benefit of the doubt before, you know, not like carelessly or, you know, with caution sometimes, but, you know, the benefit of the doubt because, you know, we're, I think we're all trying to um, better humanity in, in a way, you know, if, we, if we're, especially when we're playing music. Um, but when you start looking at, you know, at systemic um, racism and systemic oppression, um, it's hard, you know, it's hard not to, because what you see are de decent, sometimes decent people that have just benefited from this oppression. That's why I read that Ella Baker quote, decent people that have benefited from this system where other decent people have not. Now that, now I'm going to stop talking like Bob, that shit pisses me off. <laughs> I didn't go all the way there. <laughs> but that's really what pisses me off. You know, like, <laughs> I'm decent too, you know, two, two, two decent people. One just has a whole lot more, you know, benefit from a, 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 a jacked up system. <laughs> you know, and that's, the, that's why when I ask, like, what's your sense of purpose and why are you doing this? That's really the questions you have to ask yourself. And that's the only reason why I even pose them. Because one day, if you don't, those questions come back and bite you in the ass. I promise. Because the older you get, the wiser you get. And that's the only thing, I, you know, as teachers, I think, you know, if we can point people in the, in the direction of wisdom, it's, you know, not always easy. You know, some teachers don't even have it. But um, that's, you know, because it, I don't want everybody to wait till they're 50 before they start, you know, being conscious of seeing, you know, things. And um, if anybody can learn from my mistakes, that's, that's a good thing. So I, I think like it's, it's, it's the armor's there, but we have to control what we want to do with it because if not, I don't think we're serving ourselves, nor the music, nor society, nor humanity, you know? And I think at the end of the day, when we ask ourselves why we do what we do, I think the answer is in somewhere in that area. It's a service to something. Now, if it's just to yourself, well then, you know, we don't really have anything to talk about anyway. You know what I mean? But when you're servicing something beyond yourself, then that's when it gets interesting. On that note, I think we're out of time. But thank you so much for this amazing presentation. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Sorry we didn't get to everyone, but I appreciate you being present, and the energy was awesome. Again, we want to thank our sponsors, particularly for this event, the University Musical Society. Thank you, Terry Lynn, for a wonderful presentation. It was enlightening and interesting, and it was a pleasure to have you. Again, I want to thank the organization team. And tomorrow we have a series of events, really exciting, a panel of up and coming artists, a panel of student artists, a panel of scholars and professors, and our keynote speaker for the day, Camille Thurman. We hope you can enjoy. We hope you can come and enjoy. And thank you all again for being here. I hope you have a great night. And I want to give a big shout out to Sherry Tucker. She's like one of the most amazing people. And um, you guys are lucky to be in her presence. <laughs> we had a question, but we couldn't get to it. Oh no, well, I'll stay on. You all can go. I wanna, I wanna hear whatever the, Sherry has to say because she's <laughs> one of our idols. 
She's the the, the, the grand poobah and all of this. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Thank you. you are. I don't know how I can ask. I, I don't know how I can ask my question after what you just said because I'm like. <laughs> I need to think about it. I need to like absorb it. It was so profound. And you, you know, you always, you're su su such a future, you're a futurist, you know, I think you always are somehow able to see beyond the limitations that are, you know, that are there, whether it's the bandstand or the, you know, history books or the ways people are dealing with inequity, you know, you're able to kind of see that, you're future directed and you you help us to to see the future and see different you you break the paradigms oh thank you i'm to... i'm i'm not worthy <laughs> so you are. seriously no, you like, i'm gonna say anything you say i'm gonna write it in a quote and put it in my bio well i think <laughs> you know someday i want to hear i want to hear your story about how you went from um, having this unique experience where you really did not have the kinds of experiences you heard women jazz musicians tell you about later on. Like you, I've heard you say this before, you know, where, where you didn't relate to the experiences that, that women were saying they were having. And yet it didn't make you go, oh, well, you just have to play. You just have to do your job. You just have to play well, which so many people do, right? They're just like, you know, it can't exist if, it, if, if I don't you know and then you didn't do that and then how you went from that I want to know like what are the moments who are the people you learn from I'm thinking it's has I mean Jerry has to have a place there and you know uh, of I, I mean I just wanted to hear that whole story but I think I, I think it's a probably a long story <laughs> so how you yeah, go from that to, like to create this whole new paradigm that's not just about including women you know it's, it's not just about including women which is always you know presuming there's an include inside and outside and there's all kinds of problems with that you know how you go from that to you know jazz, jazz and gender justice and jazz and gender and racial justice honestly I, in a nutshell i can say it in a, in a couple of sentences I, I think what i hear you saying I, I i need to talk to you more about exactly what you mean but um what I think, you know, your, your, one of your mentors or teachers is <laughs> Dr. Angela Davis. And as you know, she's a, a very close friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And I have been hanging out with her for 30 years. And what's amazing is I didn't come to all of this sooner because she was right there saying all the right things. And I was absorbing it, but not actually doing it. And she would check me, you know, when I would say some crazy things. And so now I tease her and I'm like, why didn't you like really just sit me down <laughs> before and, you know, <laughs> tell me like, what are you doing? And, um, you know, her method, she said of teaching is just to point out sometimes, you know, a, a different way of thinking about something. And then eventually, you know, somebody will get it. And it took me like 30 years and I really, I'm thankful for her because what I realized is information was, you know, was being stored. Mm -hmm. And the, though I was just being a bit of a knucklehead, um, it was it was there. And then, you know, like I said, I was I think, you know, I was afraid to open Pandora's box because I know my personality, too. And I, I, I can't do something half ass. So like once I, I knew, I think the universe was actually protecting me. So once I was going to jump into this, I knew I would get consumed and I would have to, you know, I'm a fighter, you know, I knew I would have to, you know, you know, just, it was going to change my life. And I think I wasn't ready for that on some spiritual cosmic level, you know, until more recent years, I had other work to do, you know, before, and now this has become such a big part of my work. And it also upsets me. And I think I couldn't deal with it before because I didn't have enough maturity either. There's a lot of reasons, but it's not reasons I chose. It's just reasons that, you know, I'm, I'm protected, I think. <laughs> you know, things come in the right time, but I am grateful to her. So we, we both share, you know, her, I guess, you know, as somewhat of a mentor. And um, yeah, I'm grateful. Thank you. Well, we can talk about that. You know, we can talk on the phone anytime. Okay. <laughs> really, just call me. <laughs> so.
Okay. Well, thank you guys. So, uh, you people, you good people. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. And there's an announcement in the chat. There's a symposium on November 5th in honor of Jerry Allen. Um, if everyone wants to take a look, some some info that you folks might be interested in. That's right. Thank you all again for being here. It's been great. All right. All right. Have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Thank take you, care. Allie. Thank you so much, Terry Lynn. Thanks. All right, here we go. Yeah, we, maybe you'll be the first one after the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make that happen. <laughs> the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, right. The damn pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All Bye, right. everyone. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Right. Love y'all. Thank you. Thank you.